successful Western Race Saver sprint car drivers in the last couple of years. He's won several events and has transitioned into the 360 ranks in 2023, and he's here to talk about it on Dave's Home Supply. Getting up to speed, we're talking about the number 38 in sprint car driver of Kyle Rasmussen from Clovis, California. And in this interview, he talks about living in California and the special things that come out of California that help the world, along with many other topics. That's coming up after these messages. Dave's Home Supply specializes in cabinets, flooring, and countertops. Visit their website at daveshomesupply.com to look at products, services, financing, and even a free estimate. Are you looking for bookkeeping, payroll, or income tax services? Then check out the folks at For You Simple Bookkeeping. They are a licensed tax preparer throughout the entire United States. For more information, click on the link in the description. Well, joining me on Dave's Home Supply, getting up to speed, piloting the number 38 in Sprint Car. He's from Clovis, California, Kyle Rasmussen. Kyle, great to have you on the program, and uh, it sounds like it's a little on the warm side down there, even though it's coming up mid-October. Yeah, Ben, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I think they said on the radio this morning it's 98 degrees or something, and we're in October, so not really sure what's going on with that, but um, yeah, wish it was 73 or 75 and sunny, that's for sure. <laughs> well, uh, I guess a few more a few more days or perhaps a week or so for you to, to get, uh, get, get your tan on or something. Yeah, we're going to hope that there's a little more, uh, you know, bearable weather for our, our Friday, Saturday races coming up um, at Hanford and Tulare, and then we roll into Trophy Cup and hoping for a little cooler weather for that. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Like, what was it last year at Gold Cup? It was like 110 and just miserable. Um, yeah, but I just mean, ridiculous weather. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, but and that was, but that was in September of of last year. So it's for people that don't know the Central Valley. You know, it really reminds me kind of without the humidity. It re really reminds me of sort of like a quote unquote Southern climate, kind of like uh, Texas or some places in the South obviously yeah. absent the high humidity yeah just super dry um i mean obviously you go back to your midwest and and states like that and you know humidity is is horrible it's just awful um i think i'd take dry heat over humidity any day but i also live here so i think i'm a little biased sure Sure. Yeah. You always know when you're in a hot place. What, what, what always throws me off at first when, well, two things. One was, uh, the first time I, you know, I, I grew up civil war studies was my speciality in high school and in college. And I had never, you know, I've still never been really to a true, you know, through the true South. It's always been like Orlando for Disney world or like a layover at DFW. But but to see cotton fields for the first time in the Hanford Tulare area just boggled my mind. And uh, it's like, holy smokes. I associate that with super hot heat. Yeah, I mean, I don't think a lot of people realize how much farming and just what kind of, um, I don't know if it's the right word, but infrastructure that California and the Valley has. Um, just because you go down the 99 and you see trees um, of all different shapes and sizes and colors. Um, yeah, you get off the main roads and I mean, there's fields and fields for, for as far as you can see. Um, so California is definitely a, a huge farming, uh, industry for that. Well, the last time I went to Disneyland, my mom got to go with me and when we got to, and you know, she got to go to the races at Kings. Um, it was when USAC CRA was there, you were there, you actually won that night. And, but, um, but she was blown away. She always, and she's born and raised in the Northwest. She's been to California lots of times, but it's always, I just realized that she's mainly just flown to California and she's basically flown over the majority of the state. So she didn't really get sort of a, of embrace or see with her own eyes. Like once you get down in, in out of the Siskiyous and into the Sac Valley, like it goes on and on and on. And it's, uh, um, apricot orchards, uh, olive orchards, uh, vineyards, like it's, you know, fields of all sorts of diff. you name it, California has it and orange, orange groves. And it, it and, uh, I mean, in your neck of the woods, you guys got walnut farms and raisin farms. It's, it's pretty incredible. Yeah. I think, 
I mean, I'm no farmer, um, but I don't I don't know if right now it's still that's where the money is. But almonds for sure are, are definitely the kind of the biggest thing that people see. Yeah. And, you know, something else that's interesting and you can definitely tell when you are by one is there's um, like north of Sacramento, like Williams area or so. There's lots of like rice paddy fields. And the reason I say you know when you're near one is all of a sudden like flies and insects of all sorts of different sorts just, I mean, they just pelt your windshield <laughs> to where that you, you, you got to clean it occasionally because it, that's how many bugs that are flying around in the, in these, you know, water, water fields that they're raising rice. Yeah. I was going to say the mosquitoes are crawling through your air vents, but that's, those are <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, but no, it's super cool. It, it's it's real. the other thing too, especially Hanford uh, area. And the only reason I say this is one time I was going to Trophy Cup with one of my best friends, Brian Crockett, and we we ended up taking the long way to to uh, to Larry for Trophy Cup, and we had to cut over Coalinga, which uh, Harris Ranch exit, which is uh, the one ninety eight, and that takes you. To the 99, but you go through Hanford, and the thing that really blew my mind going through Lemoore and Hanford was these air conditioner units on top of people's basically roofs, where I was used to like a you know a central heating AC unit on the ground next to a house, but these are placed on on people on folks' houses roofs, and that just that just boggles my still boggles my mind. <laughs> yeah, I mean when you have the heat like us and. Again, the dry air, um, there's really no getting away from it. So, um, so I mean, it's definitely necessary. Uh, I don't see it any any more weird. Um, you know, they're just AC units that we grew up around them. And, um, but, yeah, I mean, even going, <clears throat> you know, to things that you don't see all the time, you go to the Midwest and you tell them, oh, yeah, it's, it's hot back home. Um you know, we have to run our sprinklers and they go, what are sprinklers? Um, cause they just don't have them. They also mm-hmm. don't have back fences. So yeah, just the different cultures and the different areas that had this, this and that. And, and then you go to the coast and they don't have AC units. That's not sure. a thing. Um, which I think it's supposed to be 90 degrees in Pismo or something like that this mm-hmm. weekend. So they're going to have a good time, but uh, <laughs> different, the difference is, is, is pretty wild. Yeah, that's the thing. I remember watching a San Francisco Giants baseball game, and they were talking about, um, you know, you don't own an air conditioner in in the city because you don't need one because it's constantly yep. soup. And it gets, like, in July, like, it, even even though it's a nice sunny day, like 70, 80 degrees, it'll still, you know, get pretty, pretty cold, you know, when the marine layer comes in and the sun goes down. Yeah, definitely own the jackets and definitely own the the swimsuits when you live in places that uh, they say you don't need air conditioning. <laughs> Most definitely. Most definitely. So talking about you, uh, 2023, you guys have ran some races this year. You guys have won some races. That aforementioned race at King Speedway in Hanford picked up a Western Race Saver Sprint Series victory on April 22nd. Also did so at the fair race in June uh, three podiums, three top fives, five top tens, nine starts overall this year. And you guys also had a 10th place uh, finish at Thunderbolt Raceway on April 14th with the Kings of Thunder 360s. How would you say your program's rolling so far this year from, from your own words? I think from our, I guess our standards from the last couple years um, that we were we can say pretty successful in the three Oh five. Um, obviously this year we've kind of split our time between the three Oh five and, and kind of our first year in the three sixty with, with cutting our teeth on that. And, um, definitely a change between the three Oh five and the three sixty. Um, just, just the speed and the wing speed and, and how the car is going to react. Um, you know, it, it's been a, we'll say not a struggle, but a, definitely a challenge. Um, just trying to make the car work how we want it to work. Um, I know there's guys that go, you got to set it up this way. Well, you, you can do different stuff to a car to, to suit a driver or a driver to suit to a certain car. Um, but I would say that our, our 305 season wasn't what 
um, we were used to just because we were, we were splitting time and focusing more into the 360 series. Um, we were, we were, I mean, we won, don't get me wrong, but when you compare it to our last two years, um, you know, it, it definitely didn't stack up to what we were used to, but that's okay. Um, you know, getting our feet wet and, um, obviously with the three sixties, you know, bringing in new sponsors and, um, you know, introducing them to the sport and, and them really enjoying it. And, um, you know, obviously having fans maybe from the three Oh five now, you know, move to the three sixties or three sixty fans kind of start liking this kid. That's just the three Oh five kid. Um, you know, it's been, it's been fun. Um, a lot of it, you know, every weekend is family. I think that's probably one of the most important parts of racing is, is the family and friends that you get to see and you, you make the friends and, um, you know, you just don't see them all the time. And when you do it, they're always there smiling, you know, sometimes giving you a hard time, but it's all in, it's all in good fun. Well, and you mentioned something very interesting. I've always asked drivers, you know, what's the comparison between, a, you know, they go to a 410 and then split their time between a 410 and a 360 or they're coming up from the micros or the cage carts and what's it like in a 360. But uh, you gave some interesting insight of a, a racer. And when I talk about, you know, for listeners that aren't are uh, unfamiliar with the Western Race Saver Sprints, that is a 305 Race Saver engine that's uh, – that's utilized. You're the. F- I, I just realized you're one of the first people that I've talked that is uh, to that has went from a 305 to a 360. So that was that uh, that very interesting, and, and it does make sense. Kind of, you know, the speed is a little bit more, the power is a little bit more, and um, but you were saying that the setups aren't identical. Like you have to you have to tweak with the setup that you would use at, let's say, Hanford, you've got to throw a little bit different thing, uh, some things at it versus uh, with the 360 versus the 305. Yeah. I mean, you can look at them and go, those are the same exact cars. Um, but, you know, everything, they may have the same parts, but all your numbers are going to be, you know, skewed or different. Um, I think a big thing that we've kind of noticed and I think everybody has fought this year was tires and the new change with Hoosier um, and kind of changing the internals of their tires, trying to make a tire last and be a little bit more durable and, and usable for teams. Um, <clears throat> but uh, that's been one to, to kind of learn and, and what a tire is going to do um, at certain pressures and, and, you know, on certain tracks and, and everything like that. And, um, you know, we, I started in, in, we'll say go-karts for a very short time and then went to outlaw carts, um, which doesn't have suspension. Um, and then, you know, obviously got a ride, um, for Don Bohm and his 305, um, kind of in the early stages, I guess maybe the second year of the 305s, the, the race savers in California here. And, um, then got to figure out what suspension was like and how it, how it reacts with your torsion bars to your shocks to, you know, your radius rods and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, jumping from a 305 to a 360, I think the biggest thing as a driver for me was, was getting my timing. Um, cause in your mind, you just have that internal clock of, um, you know, I ran this track, this is where I'm going to enter if I'm going to run this certain line. Um, you know, obviously that changes when you get into traffic and you have to make moves where, where sometimes you don't want to be, but, um, yeah, the, the speed and the wing speed, um, have, you know, the car reacts a little different in certain spots, you know, comparing cars. Um, but just knowing what the car is going to do when, when you're on the track in certain spots, I think has been the biggest thing for me. And then as a crew and, you know, uh, my dad is my crew chief, Rusty Rasmussen. And then, uh, my grandpa, my grandfather, Ron Rasmussen, he's been doing our motors with a little help from uh, Dennis Meisner Jr. But uh, just getting everything to where we think it needs to be, obviously having a lot of input from other teams. Um, and you just can't take everybody's word for granted. You have to, you have to find somebody that, um, you know, is truthful and will tell you the truth and not just tell you the, 
you know, something and you go run down a rabbit trail that leads to nothing. Um, so, and you kind of pick the information out that you, that you want, or maybe you know is correct. The other, you just kind of discharge. Um, so those people have been a huge help and I, I won't throw their names out there cause they don't want a line of people at their door knocking, wanting tips. So sure. uh, we're, we'll keep that one under our hat, but the help that we've gotten has been very appreciative, um, from us and, um, this year has definitely been the year to cut our teeth and, and see where we stack up. Obviously I think we're, we're very middle of the pack. Um, I don't believe we're in the back, um, but we just need the consistency. You know, we've had a motor failure this year, um, a few DNFs from, you know, racks or um, just not being ready, having the cars ready and, and everything like that. So it's definitely been a new challenge. That's, that's for sure. Well, and this Western Race Saver Sprints group has produced, I think, that uh, uh, I wouldn't say it's really replaced anybody. It's added to uh, the 360 ranks and filled those up for Central Central Valley racers. You know, you got guys like, well, you know, like Blake Robertson was, uh, was a huge, huge supporter of this. Well, and still is, but, uh, like he actually came out of retirement to race and won the championship in 2016. And you've got drivers like George Tristo jr. Um, the Pombos, you know, Davey Pombo and, um, and then Grant Dunkirk and Grant Champlin yourself, Brooklyn Holland, uh, Brennan warmer dam. I mean, you start naming people and these are drivers that have moved in fully in the 360s or still split their time between 360s and the race savers and and it's it's good to see that there's there's new blood coming in um to both the race savers as well as the as as the 360 ranks because that's important uh to have a steady stream of of new new drivers and and new talent to come in to enhance what's already a, a wonderful wonderful product yeah i think the 305s have been very beneficial. Um, like you said, obviously they've, they've developed, um, and given the 360 classes, some good drivers and some good talent. Um, the three Oh fives, I think when they first started, obviously it was, it was a program that, um, was, we'll say a cheaper, um, or lower cost to get into racing. Um, and it, it kept the competition level very even with all the sealed motors and the and the tech and, and everything that you have to go through to, to have a motor. Not saying it's a you know a pain in the butt to do, um, but to have an even playing field um, and to keep that competition so tight um, has been good. Obviously, as things progress, um, racing isn't the cheapest thing, so parts get more expensive, innovation changes, and you're paying more money for your, your engines and your injectors and everything like that. But, um, I think the 305s, um, they, they definitely succeed in the, um, in other states and in, in Texas and, you know, Nebraska and those states around there. Um, and I don't know if that's for the lack of 360s because, you know, the 305s are kind of the show back there. Um, and with the presence of 360s in California, um, you know, 305s were really popular when they first started. Um, in our first year, you know, it, it wasn't unnormal to have 22 cars on a night. Um, and unfortunately now, you know, we kind of wish for 15. That's, that's pretty good showing. Um, but yeah, I, I I think it's a good series. I see a lot of new faces coming in and that's awesome. Um, you know, when they come up to you or they come up to other drivers and they're asking questions, you know, we're not going to hide anything from you. We're going to let you know, you know, this is a that, and this is where you run. If you want to follow me during hot laps, you know, feel free. Um, anything that, that we can do to help you progress good, you know, we'll, we'll help you. Um, but the thing is you, you have, you're always, you always have friends. People always want to help you until you start beating them. Um, and then, and then it's fair game. So, 
Um, but no, I, I think the 305 series has been good. I think Peter Murphy is um, definitely moving on the right track of keeping the 305 series alive and, and keeping it going, especially with Brian running laps in it now. Um, and just keeping that kind of, we'll say more of a support class. Um, I know there's some shows that the 305s and the, the race savers are the main event, but um, to have that class is kind of a building block for the sprint car, um, you know, sprint car series just in a, in a whole has been really good. Well, and, you know, there's also a host of some drivers that, that race their race in the, the division now that I think, you know, it'd be a disservice not to, not to give them props and kudos because they, you know, they, they're pretty talented and they're, they're definitely, I think, on the cusp of breaking out, uh, you know, guys like Phil Hainan, um, Brandon Emmett has had a pretty good year. Um, Jesse Burks, who's, who's new to race savers. He's a former modified racer. He, he's somebody to look out uh, for, um, uh, Mauro Simone, Anthony Simone's kid is in there. Um, you know, we mentioned Davey Pombo, you know, Michael Pombo at one point had, had raced with this, but he's since moved on to three sixties. Um, and then, you know, another drop Blaine Fagundes, you can't, uh, discount him either. Um, uh, uh, you know, he's, he's been a successful racer and has been a long time with the Western race saver series. And, you know, got, got other guys like Kevin Barnes jr. And, um, and, and as you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, uh, Brian Murphy, Peter's son, he, you know, he's that new stock. Him and Jesse Burks are some of those new guys that are kind of coming in and, and, uh, shaking things up in a good way. No, and it's definitely been good. Um, I think it's good for the sports, good for the fans. Um, just good for crowds. Um, obviously car counts help with that. And, um, but yeah, Jesse and Brian, um, you know, those are two of the guys. Jesse's just a, honestly just a student of uh we'll say of the game just for lack of a better term um but if he asks you a question or you just start talking you can kind of just tell that he just starts paying attention um gets real quiet um you know and at, at the end of it he's polite says thank you thank you so much um and obviously it shows he's been um you know consistent to say the least this season and um you know i i see some some good potential there for going forward in the 305 series. Obviously he's raced before and uh, more pavement, but that can translate um, to dirt um, just with seat time and experience. But um, yeah, those two kids, um, obviously Brian has a, a pretty good mentor under, you know, under in his pocket there with Peter um, and everybody else that helps him out with that team. But um yeah, everybody else just just being super consistent this year. It's been really good. Well, and and yes, I, I I completely agree. And something that you mentioned was very interesting. Is Central Valley is always kind of thought of as you know micro sprint country, but you um you mentioned it a little bit ago. You came out of Outlaw Cage Carts. Tell me about tell me about that story. Yeah, so I. I, as a racer, I definitely don't have the, the normal, um, you know, history of racing. I didn't start when I was, you know, seven or five or something like that. I, I played baseball for however long, you know, through, through college and a little bit afterwards. And I didn't start racing um, until I was about 23, um, 24. I'm, I'll be 30 in December this year. Um, so I haven't been at it for very long. Um, and had definitely a late start compared to a lot of guys, but, um, yeah, after kind of the senior year of college and get, getting out, I, um, I won, I started messing around with go-karts and doing flat parts with, you know, the world formula motors and, and all those kind of things. And I think I ran one race and I said, you know what, we're going, we're going out walk cart racing. And that was the, the cool thing. That's when Rico was doing it big time with Kyle and, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, at cycle land and all that kind of stuff. And it was kind of the, the cool thing. It was popular. Um, you know, Tanner Thorson was doing it before he kind of moved into the, the midget world and, and kind of dominated that for a little while. Um, but yeah, did outlaw cards 
um, for a couple years, went to Cycle Land for, you know, a, a summer or two and ran their seasons. And then obviously went to Chowchilla at, at the barn and, and ran their seasons with the Sanders. Um, and then over, over at Hanford at Tulare Cart Club, ran a couple races there. Um, so, but it, it, it was kind of a thing that I did on my own dime as kind of a college kid. And, um, you know, my dad, Rusty, he, he raced when he was younger and, um, had a pretty successful career, I would say with, with USAC and midgets and a couple sprint cars and, and champ cars here and there, a lot of micro stuff. Um, but I never really got introduced to it as a, as a kid growing up. I think my dad had gotten hurt a few times and my mom didn't want me anywhere near it. Um, and I don't think I had ever seen him race physically, maybe on a, on a videotape till I was about 25. Um, okay. I'd never seen of my dad race, um, which is probably an interesting fact to some people. You would think if, if you know who my dad is, you'd go, how, how have you never, you know, seen a video? Um, but you see pictures and obviously when I was young and we, we would all go to the tracks and be spectators. Um, but I got into this kind of on my own and my dad was there to say, if you want to do this, let's, let's do it. Um, and my mom, obviously easy, easy enough for her. She was supportive on the safety equipment. So she was helping me out with the, the race suits and the Hans devices and the, you know, the helmets and everything to keep you safe in the car. Um, and did that for a while. And then, um, I got an offer from Don Boom to, to try out a three Oh five. And after four or five or six races on the end of a season there, we ended up getting our own car. So, um, you know, it was pretty cool. Um, I enjoy outlaw car. I can tell you it's definitely not a, a, a forgiving car. It makes you sore and it's not built for big people. Um, I'm six five, so I, I'm not sure how I fit in them. Um, a little origami maybe, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's kind of the outlaw cart history in a nutshell. Well, that's interesting that you, you know, you made the trip up to, to cycle land. So view, viewers or listeners that are unfamiliar with what cycle land is, it's, it's, you know, the, the summertime home of cage cart racing, you could say in, in really the country. And it's actually not too far from silver dollar speedway in Chico on the 99 and where Kyle's from is Clovis. And, uh, that's, that's just outside of Fresno in the Fresno area. So that's, that's a hike to get there. Um, what that's probably about four, what, four hours, one way, four and a half hours, depending on traffic. Yeah. I think with traffic and a trailer, if you're following all of our laws here in California, I think <laughs> just over five hours. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. We did the red bluff once for nationals and, um, that was a pretty quick show. We ended up wadding up a, a chassis there, so called it quits early. But yeah, um, yeah. yeah that's uh, a long going north. Red Bluff, Red Bluff can be a little unforgiving. It can get a little wild. Yeah, QRC makes their money there. That's for sure. <laughs> that's awesome. But you mentioned the Chowchilla, uh, the the barn, a uh, Chowchilla barn burner. They have a series there, which is, which is, you know, I think it's producing some some uh, some decent uh, talent. Uh, that I'm seeing coming coming up to Red Bluff on their off weekends or, you know, West Coast Nationals. And I think we'll be seeing some of those guys transition into sprint cars before too long. And that, that that's going to be exciting, I think. I think so. And I, I, I look forward to that. Um, you know, I think the biggest thing that I've realized and maybe have noticed, um, and I can tell you other drivers have too, um, you know, is, when you get a guy that comes out of something like a, we'll say a micro and an outlaw cart and transfers over to sprint cars, I think the biggest thing that other drivers are, are kind of hoping and we'll say expecting is just respect for equipment and um, just, just clean driving. I mean, just don't come in and just water guy, you know, um, kind of like what outlaw carts have maybe a bread of, of just door and guys. And I know red bluff kind of 
put, uh, you know, a foot on that and, and kind of put a kibosh to that, you know, just coming in and doing a guy in the corners, you know, at the checkered or something, because, you know, that's not racing. Um, you know, if you got to move a guy, you know, once in a while, okay. But if you can't pass him clean, you know, unfortunately, some nights you're going to have to end up second, third, fourth. Um, but I think that that's the biggest thing that I've seen um, of transferring through classes of from that to sprint cars is, is just having respect for stuff and other guys. And um, obviously, if you race them clean, you know, more times than not, they're going to run you clean. And uh, you get to roll your stuff in the trailer at the end of the night. And that's what everybody kind of hopes for. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. And, you know, that's not to take, a, you know, we're talking about cage carts here. We're not uh, diminishing or or talking down to because I think the micro scene in central California, it speaks for itself. It's so successful. And a, a lot of drivers based in the Central Valley that are doing well now have came from that Plaza Park and Visalia, Lemoore, uh, even uh, Delta, uh, Delta and Stockton. And it's, uh, you know, all of it is good. All the, all these drivers that are cutting their teeth at a super young age or a younger age, or, you know, even, even guys that kind of are going your route and getting a late introduction to, to racing that it's making racing better. And, you know, they're getting the, uh, the, the essentials down, um, and out of the way early and they're learning how, how to be intelligent racers. And that way, when they move up, you know, uh, you hope that they retain that and uh, you know that racing etiquette and uh, and uh, intelligent driving. Yeah, and you know that that's all you can hope for. Obviously, that it, that just comes with with time. Um, but but yeah, I think the micro scene. Obviously, I never I never was in it. Um, I've been to a few shows, you know, at Lemoore and Plaza, and um, you know, been down to to Jake's place at D One Driven. Um, you know, with him and, uh, you know, Gary's not there, obviously, um, you know, unfortunately he's passed, but, um, all those guys down there. And, um, I think you've talked to, I think it was Mitchell Pizzento and, and Cole and, you know, there's, um, I think it was Mitchell that maybe commented about, um, you know, Corey Eliason and all those guys, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there is quite the lineup um, of talented drivers that came from the Central Valley that ran, you know, micros and went through those ranks that have been very successful in sprint cars. Um, yeah, no, you, you definitely cannot discredit the, the micro realm um, because they, they definitely nowadays, I mean, I, I don't know what it was back when I was younger. Um, but nowadays those, those things just, flat out call they those guys put on a show sure and you know and same with the cage carts just the technology is this isn't you know rinky dinky going to somebody's parking lot and playing around with go-karts these are these are actual racing machines where they're investing a lot of a lot of money and a lot of technology and making these things go go faster and i mean you know they're they're dynoing these things basically, which is which is which is incredible. I mean it's it's taken very seriously um, because there's there's uh you know there's a long later on long when these drivers' careers they have ambitions to get to the top and so they're taking um, they're having fun obviously and and you know getting the basics down but uh, but also they are they're taking the same approach as really some some of these. Uh, some of these teams that you see like with the world of outlaws take, I kind of would can, and you may see this, you know, you being a baseball guy see, have seen this and I've seen it with wrestling is when I wrestled in high school, it was, it was, I was wrestling in high school. Now you're having these former college wrestlers be the coaches and it's almost developed in the, the elite level of college wrestling where middle school wrestling was just, I'll just go out there, have fun. And it's, basically at the level and the caliber of high school wrestling. And I'm not sure if that's a fair comparison to baseball, but that I think is what's happening in racing and, and not taking the joy and fun out of it for, for people that are just starting and having your kid grow up super fast, but it's just, it's being, there's a professional approach, uh, younger, younger ages, which I think, um, 
I think is cool. I think I, you know, I think that's that's something that's very interesting that I would have never foresaw 10, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, I think that's a big thing that you see in just about any sport, sir. You can just say in anything in life nowadays. The kids are so young and doing things that you know I was doing when I was thirteen. Um, you're doing them when you're five or six. That's sure. you got me. Um, but I think it's good. Um, obviously, if if your kid or you know your the kid that you're you're coaching or or helping is has got the drive and wants to, um, heck yeah, go, go and do it. Um, do it while you can do it while they want to. And if they keep wanting to keep going down the road, see where it takes you. Um, but I think it's, I think it's going to be good seeing the future maybe, of of racing and, um, you know, so many good drivers just in this area in general, um, and we'll, we'll call it just this little hotbed of, of California. The amount of people that have, have driven and know the knowledge, not just as drivers, but um, understand cars and how, you know, there's definitely more to it than just being a driver. Um, you know, know how a car works, know what adjustments can be made when, um, what a car needs, what a motor needs to sound like, what it needs to feel like and how to fix those problems when they arise um, are definitely two, you know, things to have in your tool belt to succeed. And as younger kids come and, you know, the, the ages and the older guys, you know, phase out, obviously, hopefully we, we hope they phase back in as, as, you know, maybe a team owner or a car owner or, or just a crew chief or a coach of helping the younger generation, um, you know, be as successful or even more, um, just with their knowledge and passing that down. Yes. And I should also have a disclaimer if, you know, there's kids or families that want to get into it to have family bonding time and just want to have fun. Like that's totally okay. I, you know, I totally respect that decision. Um, it's just, it's just, you're seeing this, uh, this full on, um, dedication. And again, it comes down to the technology of what they're able to do with some of these race cars, um, for drivers that, um, that are, you know, not even teenagers sometimes. And it's just, it's just, I, I, you know, going back to baseball, it's kind of one of those things where you got guys with all the telemetry and stuff that they can do. Like you go into a, um, you know, a batting cage and they're able to, you know, use this modern science that they've developed with all the technology to perfect swinging earlier, better, more effective, and and all that good stuff. Yeah, the technology is, I mean, every year you look at it and you go, well, that can't get any better. Um, and then it does, and obviously it <laughs> gets more expensive, but that's okay, it's part of it. Um, but, you know, I, I think the kind of the biggest thing is I think the coolest thing is having just family there um, and making it just kind of a family thing. Um, I think most of my family comes um, and I know other drivers have, um, you know, families come or just a, a gaggle of friends and family um, at their trailers. And, you know, that's, that's kind of what it's about. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, and to, to enjoy yourself at it. Cause if you're not having fun while you're doing it, then why are you doing it kind of thing? So yeah, if it's not fun, you're not going to stick with it. So sure. you, you got to make it somehow. Sure. I had a question for you. 38 in what's the story with that number? And is the in uh, symbolic for any sort of reason? <laughs> so, um, we'll start with the 38. Um, and I thought the number when I chose it, um, 38 was my dad's number when he raced. Um, obviously, he ran a few other cars, but their their car or cars were 38. Um, and I got told that that number was actually, um, it just came on a car. Um, they didn't pick it. It just came on a car that they got, and they stuck with it. And 38 was my dad's number. Um, and if my story is wrong, 
and I don't believe it is. That's that's how 38 got chosen. So, and I didn't know any better. So when I started, I wanted to be the same number as um, as my dad. Okay. So I picked 38, and then so we were 38 for uh, quite a while, and you know, about a year and a half, maybe coming up on two years. Um, my grandmother on my dad's side had passed. Um, her name was Nancy. Um, and we chose to do 38 in, um, for her, um, on the car. And, um, you know, obviously my grandfather is, is a huge part of our program, um, of doing motors and keeping those running, um, as strong as they do. Um, so, we, we chose to put the in for Nancy, um, kind of in tribute for her. Oh, that's awesome. That's very touching. Yeah. Well, um, it's been great having this conversation with you, uh, Kyle. Um, 2023, you kind of hit on it. There's some 360 shows coming up. Um, and is that going to kind of do it for the year after, like, Trophy Cup is kind of the bookend of 2023, or is there some other stuff you guys are looking at maybe running um, before the – calendar switches to 2024 uh yeah so we got what do we got like five races coming up in the next eight days or so so that'll that'll be a good um a good little spot and then i believe um my schedule says i have a tuesday wednesday um as a thanksgiving race in merced which i think i saw on their scheduling um i think it's just wednesday okay. if i'm not mistaken on uh, November 22nd. Um, I'll have to double check on that, but we should have a, a 360 race in Merced for, for kind of their Thanksgiving Turkey night deal. Um, and then I think we're going, I don't race midgets, but we usually go to, to Turkey night in Ventura. So if that's kind of the plan, we'll, we'll probably be there spectating or helping or, or whatever we decide. It's always a good time in Ventura. i I so wish that there was a, a NARC race or a 360 wing race there. Um, I, I want, I would love to announce one race there, at least in my career. That's one of my favorite tracks. It's definitely, definitely a cool one. Uh, a story that some people may not know. Um, and it didn't happen. So I'm going to tell it anyways. And if, <laughs> if, if, if Jim Naylor's, you know, mad at that, that's okay. Um, but there was kind of a push, um, maybe in my second or third year, 305 to do a non-wing 305 series, um, at Ventura okay. uh, for, for them, for that track. Um, and there was a lot of talk with, with Jim and, um, you know, our series director and stuff. And I just don't think we could get enough guys to dedicate that, that far of a drive from the central Valley. Um, you know, every other weekend for non-wing stuff. So tried to do an ex, uh, an exhibition. They decided not to. So that's kind of a story that never, ever happened, but kind of would have been cool, um, to see at Ventura for sure. 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 Um, who, who are some, I mean, you mentioned some individuals and you're more than welcome to mention them again, but people that help you with the 38 N operation, or any sponsors that you'd like to acknowledge? I, I just want to give you the floor here for a little bit. No, I appreciate that. And they, obviously they do too. Um, yeah, my dad, Rusty, he's my kind of my crew chief and, um, you know, sets the car for the most part. And if I have any input, you know, for what things need to be done, uh, we'll discuss that and go from there. And, you know, my grandfather is, is our motor guy of building and tuning and keeping them sharp and, um, you know, definitely allows me to pour the coal to him. Um, so that's been fun doing it with three generations of, of Rasmussen's and, um, you know, Mark, our crew guy, we're probably one of the smallest crews out there. So that's always fun to, to go beat on a bigger team, uh, every now and then, but the, the sponsors that definitely make it happen, um, you know, couldn't do it without them is you know, obviously Fresno roofing, um, fashion furniture, basket mechanical engineering, Nap Auto Parts, Carlisle Tools, Peels, um, you know, Central California Truck and Trailer Sales, Basket Upholstery, Hedrick Chevrolet, uh, Capitan Brothers Law Firm. Um, you know, obviously it's, 
it's always fun having a sponsor that, that loves racing. Um, you know, whether or not they, they just don't have the time or, or, you know, the want to own a car and go do it themselves. Um, but to have them on a car and, you know, get to fulfill that, that want of theirs and also help us out. Um, it's just kind of two birds, one stone kind of thing. And it's been awesome to have everybody on board, um, and enjoy it. But, uh, hopefully maybe have maybe one or two new sponsors come in for, uh, to support our 360. Um, can't tell you who yet, but we're going to cross our fingers that those, those pan out. Um, but yeah, always, always hats off and thank you to our sponsors. Um, can't do it without them. And that's something I was going to ask. 2024, is it going to be predominantly 360 stuff, or are you going to kind of do what, replicate what you did this year and mix it up a little bit if there's an off weekend for 360? Is going to run race savers if they so happen to be on the schedule? Yeah, I think we're going to have maybe a, um, a little more dominant of a 360 schedule. Um, and like you said, when there's an off, an off night for the 360s, um, you know, the 305 is always going to be sitting there in the shop ready to go. Um, just prime the fuel and throw some tires on it. But, uh, yeah, I, I think it'll be predominantly more 360s. Um, just getting seat time, that experience. Um, obviously, more laps equals more consistency and better finishes. So that's what we're looking for. Okay. And as far as team news, when you guys um unravel your 2024 schedule or results for these upcoming races in the central valley is there a good website is there a good social media page you guys use or if you guys have apparel for sale is there a good way folks can uh can get a hold of a a shirt or a sweatshirt yeah so um i'm on facebook and instagram i don't use my instagram all that often i try to limit my social media usage um but i am on facebook quite a bit um, so you can just add me as a person. Um, I think my team name is, is tagged next to it, um, for KMR racing or Kyle Rasmussen. Um, but yeah, that's where my schedule will be. Um, uh, kind of have to wait until track issue theirs and we'll kind of finalize ours. Uh, I think it's usually around December, uh, January area that we come up with something. Um, and then, merchandise and and all the goodies are are at the trailer um no no website just at the track come and see us um come visit come talk um um hats shirts um are available awesome well i'll have to get a hold of a kyle rasmussen rasmussen shirt really soon so uh, i'm definitely in the market Well, it's been great chatting with you, Kyle. Been great getting to know your story and your journey and where um, you're wanting things to go. Um, We'll definitely be staying in touch, especially for 2024, and let the world know what uh, the 38N team is going to be up to in 2024. Absolutely. Hopefully we're a little more of a a presence in the 360s, and um, and we'll, we'll see how it goes. Well, that is going to do it for this interview. We hope you enjoyed it. Be sure and hit the like and subscribe button on whatever platform you found this interview at. It really helps us grow the channel, and we greatly appreciate it. In the meantime, we'll be back with more content and interviews in the future. Be sure and have a great evening or a great rest of your day, whatever time you're listening.